then is really to introduce Professor Tim Lang, um, just, just researching his biog online. Um, he's Professor of Food Policy at City University's London Centre for Food Policy since 2002. Um, what struck the chord with me was actually like our speaker last year, Patrick Holden, he was a hill farmer in the 1970s. I don't know what it was about hill farming in the 1970s, but um, that certainly drew Tim's attention to food policy, where he spent 30 years um, researching and debating around those issues, both locally and globally. Um, and with his co-author, Jeff Rayner, he's just produced a book, the ecological, the ecological Public Health, Reshaping the Condition of Good Health. So, ladies and gentlemen, I'll give you Professor Tim Lang. Now, is it all right for me to sit down? Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm used to standing up, don't worry. But uh, if you can see, I don't go over here. So, because uh, uh, I've been asked to do slides, but... I have to say, I'm going off them. <laughs> so, I, actually, I think there's Jerry here. Yeah, you are. Oh, my God. Can you just leave the room? And then I'll <laughs> say what I can say. Um, I'd like to live dangerously and just say the slides are yours, Jerry. But can I not use them? Um, I might just use a couple. Let's see. Because, given it was like this, um, and I said a horseshoe, like this, I thought it might be nicer if I was uh, shorter. And the problem with PowerPoints is um, oh, they look fancy, but they're bloody boring. Um, I speak as someone who does everything by PowerPoint now, so it would give me intense pleasure if I could just speak with you. Is that right? Huh? Yeah. You can have the There you are. I mean, essentially, thank you for that. Um, uh, We'll talk about what it is about hill farming later. You can ask about that. Um, I am here asked really to talk about the ideas that led to this uh, book that Jeff Rayner and I spent all of last year writing until March this year, after working together for about 20 years and really trying to answer a very simple question. What is public health? What do we mean by public health? Well, at one level, it's very obvious. It's the health of the public. I can go now. That's it. Sorted. It's what it says on the tin. Except it isn't. Uh, actually, there are very different arguments about what we mean by public health. And there are different traditions of thinking and understanding of what we mean by public health. Now, I work on food. I'm a food man from when I was a farmer to the present. Uh, and I work in the middle of the city of London, my university is that, it's, I literally look one way at the, the, you know, the city, where one of the three great capital flow points of the planet. Here we are in the middle of a banking crisis, and ten years ago people used to say, why on earth are you at City University? You ought to be at Swindon, you ought to be at... Uh, Rather like a cultural college, you ought to be somewhere else. Well, actually, cities are the problem. And cities are also going to be the solution. And cities are where the problems about public health come to a fore. And the gap between cities and the rurality, this is globally, are actually one of the main fault lines in modern life. And in terms of health, they're one of the major dividers, actually. And yet, we need the countryside to produce food for cities, and yet cities don't actually live on their own. They are parasitic, and this is tricky. So you can see something very simple, what is public health and so on, and public. And now look at what I'm going into, your brains are all going, twiggy, 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 and see. There are basically different traditions, and I might actually just go here. Um, in our book, Jeff and I put it as this. Jeff likes Venn diagrams. He's not here, so I can say, I don't really. Um, but we agreed on this one. Um, because in our book, we spell out in enormous and boring detail. We love it, but we're not sure anyone else will. It goes on for pages and pages and hundreds of pages. We spell out that, actually. That really public health 
is now five different traditions. And the five, I'll give you a bit more. Um, but, you know, the medical at the top is basically, you know, if you've got a problem with diseases, you go to your doctor, don't you? You go to pharmaceuticals, you get instant fixes. Uh, the second one, which is health improves when you get richer. Therefore, the answer for health, forget dietetics, she's a dietitian, forget, you know, the countryside, farming, forget that, just make people richer. And they'll feed them, they'll live better, and they'll have roofs over their heads, and they'll put their warm. Uh, the social behavioural, essentially, is about saying, you're eating too much fat. I can look at her, because she's a dog, she won't mind me that. You, know, you just ate, when you walked in, you ate a muffin with chocolate. A, you don't like it, B, you don't particularly like muffins, but you still ate it. Why? We've got to all you obeying those signals that you wanted something and you were tired and you just wanted to eat something. So we've got to alter your behaviour. We've got to make Tim learn when he's tired, not go for a peanut butter sandwich. Uh, and we've got to make you bike. And what is it you Devices. And this is a social and behavioralist year, and then you'll be fit and thin. One of my colleagues bikes 12 miles each way. I bike 9 miles each way. Not every day, because I don't go in. You know, in the swim but it's a social and behavioral issue, this business of health. See the differences? <laughs> Very different traditions. The sanitary environmental is actually what most people, if you do public polls around the world, think public health is. Drains. Drains. Good water. <coughs> I live in London and I always uh, draw a graph, I'm not going to draw any walls here, uh, of the River Thames. I mean, anyone who knows anything about how river flows over time, is it, it creates sort of, doesn't create square banks like the River Thames is for most of its way. It creates flows like that. And you can look at maps and drawings and paintings of London. Uh, uh, very, until really quite recently, a couple hundred years ago. And uh, that's actually what London, the Thames was like. There were jetties out into it, but it wasn't this embankment. The embankment is actually what Basel got built in the 1870s. Where the, if you measure the, the river, you're looking down the river like that. Uh, basically, it doesn't get built like that. And let it great big drains. That, the river was used as a conduit for drains, parallel to the river, all the way out to the sea, and it literally dumped the shit in the sea. <laughs> okay? That, if you like, is the archetype of sanitary environmental approach. So, can you see we've got four very different traditions? Uh, and yet, Jeff and I arrogantly put ecological public health in the middle, going across the mall. Obviously, we would do, this is what we're arguing for. And this is an argument that is totally different, which is this. This is from our book. That essentially, human health depends upon what we now call ecosystems health. That unless we get the matching of human bodies, our physiology, and health, public health, you're talking about bodies. If we, unless we get the bodies in match with what the built environment, the, the living environment, can deal with, then you're going to have a public health problem. And back to that, the biomedical, there is an absolutely stunning set of examples now that we're going to in some length in the book. Um, uh, about the way in which the wonder drugs called antibiotics or antimicrobials are actually now being hoist by that. It's called resistance. And all the time there is a catching up, the capacity of building in uh, antimicrobial, antibacterial resistance into drugs. Uh, and the pharmaceutical industry knows that, pharmacologists know that, everyone knows that in a sense, and yet actually a huge amount of the biomedical model depends upon the capacity of pharmaceuticals to work, when in fact we've got to 
make sure that we've got a capacity for that to occur. Okay. So that's just a model. Okay. Now, let me just switch. Can I do this and show my superior PowerPoint skills and show, go to here? This is a deeply boring <laughs> okay, so be prepared to be warned. I've given you the five models. Can you look at this? Is this all right? I, by the way, I'm so well organized, I ran out from my office uh, in my house, my home, where I was working all day today, uh, and I didn't bring a copy of the book. So this is supposed to be a And I'm supposed to be selling this book to you. Of course, that why else do authors come? The answer is... You can see why I'm not performing anymore. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm very interested in ideas, you know, books, who cares, you know, who's writing it. Uh, but actually, believe it or not, it's, uh, it's only been out a week. <laughs> Amazon sold out almost instantly, I learned from one of my students. Um, there, there is, believe it or not, there's a lot of interest in this. Uh, from sort of very esoteric areas, issues, are you reading? I never read out tables, by the way. I always assume you can read. Basically, this is a cool one. This is about two-thirds of the way through the book, having done huge numbers of things. You say, look, actually, these five models are competing for our attention. Okay? This is, if you like, you've got, I teach my students, you have three minutes. We run a master's program in food policy. We teach an exercise. You've got three minutes with the prime minister. What the heck are you going to tell him? Oh, well, it's all very complicated. And I'm not going to do lots of research. And please give me the money. Oh, you've just failed. And you've got to know instantly what it is that you want. So this is our, okay, 15 minutes with the prime minister. The core idea, as you work along the thing, the core idea of the sanitary environment is that the environment is a threat. The core idea to the social behavioural is it's basically health is a function of knowledge. You know, Tim Lang is a, the world's only professor of food policy. He has. If he doesn't know how to eat healthily and sustainably, we're all doomed. Okay? I now tell you, I haven't a clue. <laughs> because do I eat fish? Yes, she says. There isn't a public health body on the planet that doesn't say eat fish. Go to the fish people and they say stop now because stocks are running out. Mm -hmm. Maybe eat mackerel, maybe eat herring, maybe eat sardines, and if nine billion people eat them, mm -hmm. two portions a week, and mm -hmm. what do you do? Mm -hmm. Got it? Mm -hmm. That's why I don't know what a sustainable diet is. Mm -hmm. This is really, really tricky stuff. What does it mean? You know, how much meat? A farmer, ex-farmer, I've killed every animal on the planet. Well, okay, Lancashire. <laughs> Uh, when I was a farmer. What, how often do we eat meat? All the public health nutrition guidance says we eat meat, lots of time to uh, restrain it a bit. I think we mostly think maybe eat it once a week. Maybe. Eat nine portions of fruit and vegetables a day. Have meat only on feast days. That's very different to what we're being told now. And how would you deal with that in a, how, in a social behavioural way? Well, that's what most people think. I mean, the Royal Society came up with a report two weeks ago, three to four weeks ago, basically rightly saying, in my view, uh, you know, the rich world is consuming and eating as though there are three planets. Mm -hmm. Actually, the US is though there are five planets. Mm -hmm. Malawi is 0.8 planets. If you want to eat like a Malawi, not many Brits and then I've got used to Tesco and Walmart, sorry, Asda, we say, okay, I'm not prepared to have the right to eat meat every day. You know, maybe meat should be different cultural rules. So I'm actually trying to show that actually I'm not dismissing, Jeff and I don't dismiss any of these models. There is a social behavioral element to food and health. Absolutely right. But it's got to be driven by that column on the right. The biomedical, well, one understands, you know, coming here, I came on the bus from Victoria, I lived just in South London to Victoria, got the 36 bus to Paddington, and I salute every time I do that. The office in which Alexander Fleming discovered penicillin, I'll tell you why I salute him, because my life was saved by it. 
1952 in India, where I lived. I have a scar from there to there, and it was, I wanted to take my arm off where I cut myself as a child, for a child. But in fact, it was antibiotics. My mother, being a good bourgeois woman, said, he's going to be a violinist. <laughs> but the penicillin saved me. It was penicillin that saved me. So it's fantastic. But it's now running out of steam, if you like. The techno-economic is the really strong evidence to it. As people get richer, look at us. Average life expectancy for boring white males in Britain is about, like me in other words, about 78, 79. Yeah, that's incredible, if you think about it. It's just rocketed. Women, 82, 83, rocketed. This is astonishing. In one century. And it's actually just by getting richer, having bedding houses, having... using coal, adding to climate change. So this is tricky. Got it? You can see why it's taken Jeff and me 20 years to try and think this through. Well, I'm not going to go through it. We could go through it. You can see, look, you can show how boring we are. Okay. <laughs> it goes on and on and on and on. Okay, which I won't do it. I won't do it, because if you, any of you are bored enough to go and get the book, you'll be able to read it. But let's just, it's actually the, this line that interests me. Uh, uh, essentially, what Jeff and I argue in our book is that the fundamental picture, when you've got one minute with the Prime Minister, the one single thing that we've got to sell off to the power brokers is that fundamentally we now have a mismatch between ourselves and the environment. And all the advantages that we've seen through the other models have actually come by raiding the environment. We've been raiding ecosystems. And that's a very, very complicated and very difficult message to sell. Because you have immediately anti-progress, wanting to lower people's standards of living. Because in fact, actually the picture that we're wanting to paint is a more complicated one than that. Which is saying, no, we can actually raise the quality of people's lives, but we've got to do it by lowering our footprint on the environment. So, I mean, essentially, that is what our book is about. Um, I mean, this is a literature festival, so I came to talk about our book and what its thesis is, what its argument is about. But, I mean, why I decided not to give the talk that I presented, because I didn't know how big the group would be, because I actually want to know what you think. I want to know how can a message about putting health at the centre of public policy and of politics and economics, what would it look like? I mean, to not cases like Jeff and me, none of those people who think about this all the time, it's plain evident that actually the thing that underpins people's quality of life actually is health. It, it's, it is so self-evident. The moment anyone is ill, one of my colleagues, age 50, had a torn over. I was with him, age 50. 50. A man who biked 12 miles a day. Okay, tall and out 50 50 is my friend. He'll never look at me. Very, very, very surprising if he does. Uh, he's just come out of a coma. Uh, now, you know, what we're dealing with in conventional senses in health, there is always a spectrum. I come from a family that's very long lived. Doesn't mean to say I will. But the joke in public health is always rule number one is choose your parents very wisely. <laughs> you know, actually, it, 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 the bodies that we put into that environment are not made by us, they're made by others. Then what we do in our lives, well, the other joke is choose your social class very well. You know? It makes a huge difference. If you're born into an affluent family, we're now in Britain, in Britain, not the UK, but in Britain, we're back to an a, 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 a health inequalities gap not seen since Victorian times. Fifteen years life expectancy 
I think it is between West Sussex and the east of Glasgow. <coughs> 15 years. This is, it's gone up. Yeah? But wow, this is extraordinary. And all the evidence and, uh, about how above a certain standard of living, above the famous World Bank threshold of $5,000 a year to live on. Remember, one billion people on the planet live below one dollar a day. It's out of sight to us. We don't know where we're born. We don't know where we're born. Uh, but even so, we have a major social problem about how we're going to be at the end of this century. I won't be around. But you never know. Uh, but what's, what by 2050? What by 2030? Actually, what Jeff and I ended up doing as we pummeled this very <coughs> computer uh, and, and his, when actually the public health is about progress. It's about progress, actually. It's about redefining the conditions and shaping them so that bodily capacities can live in health. We will always have the variation. My choosing my parents wisely versus you who chose your parents badly. That's a random. Uh, you will always have variations in the population. But it's as though you know, you've got the variation from here to here. Actually, in the 20th century, we moved them from over there to here. And we're assuming it's going to carry on going there, where life expectancy is going to go up. Why? Why do we assume that? In the era of climate change, in the era where the earth is literally being squeezed, it's not actually a very good assumption. So we, we've ended up, and our book ends, with a... It's not a sort of green, eco-trumpeting job. I'll leave that to you, even though... <laughs> <laughs> even though uh, uh, even though that's kind of where I come from and am, um, uh, actually it's more complicated than that. We've got to, we have actually got to win the argument with our fellow citizens that <coughs> consuming more if it means it's raiding ecosystems is crazy. And yet, we're now on a treadmill that if we're not consuming, it means people aren't working. And if they're not working, it means they can't earn money to buy food to do better. So we've actually got a model, an economic model, which is inappropriate for dealing with that. We have actually improved human health. We have. And don't let anyone say that we haven't. I look at my scar every time I have a shower and think, how lucky I am. I had a mother who strapped her knee to her back and ran three miles across the wet Indian hills in the foothills and got me to the one field doctor. If she'd been an Indian peasant, that would not have happened. Mm. Okay? And I got treatment. That's class. Mm. Uh, but that's not social justice. That's not giving fair shares to all 7 billion people on the planet. That's not addressing 2050. I'm a food man. Okay? I look at the 2050 issue, wow, is it serious. And the, the main response is, well, we've got to melt the system even harder. <coughs> and the model in a lot of the arguments being proposed to increase food production is saying that's in order to feed the world like the West, when actually the diet of the West is the major cause of its preventable ill health. Mm -hmm. Diet-related disease is now the 12 out of the 20 top factors for premature death in the world. And it used to be that we thought that was just a problem of the rich West, us getting fat us having heart disease, us having strokes, us having diabetes. But in sub-Saharan Africa, that 5% is clinically overweight and obese. Do you want me to repeat that? 5% of sub-Saharan Africa. 
uh, India, where I was brought up, to the age of eight, really. Bombay, a city I lived in, Mumbai now, to you and me, has the second highest rate of type 2 diabetes on the planet. It's the rich who have it. They've got fat, but poor and injured as thin as can be. So, you know, this is a strange world. But, I started, I think I'm going to stop. I started by saying, no, I'll say one more thing. Uh, I started by saying, well, what's public health? It's dead easy. It's the health of the public. Can I go now? And then I said, well, actually, it's a bit more complicated than this. I've got these different models and things. And this is you know, intellectual stuff, but it's actually very practical. Do you want to, you know, the present, the coalition government, I don't know what the politics are, it doesn't matter, it's irrelevant. But the government is the government. The government is just backed, nudge thinking which is they just want to not just to do things nicely. But actually what they've done in health, food and health, is handed over to the big food companies with uh, policy called the responsibility deals. And Jeff Rayner and I were actually on the expert advisory group on obesity, which is why I referred to it, for the Department of Health, and we were sacked by Mr. Nancy. He didn't buy Jeff and me writing rude articles in the British Medical Journal of the Lancet, that didn't help, I'm sure. But um, the whole committee was closed down. He doesn't want advice. He's basically handed over responsibility to food companies to deal with it. Uh, now, I think that's wrong, because I think, using my table analogy, where are we going to pick up this table and take it to? Is it just going to be more of the same that we did in the 20th century, which means milking the earth? Or do we move it in a different direction to protect ecosystems and to re-engage our bodies with ecosystems? Do we eat a diet which is good for ecosystems? In which case we need to eat lots of plants, not many animals. And when they're animals, only on feast days. Not every day. Not 20 times a week. <laughs> because 50% of all the cereals grown on the planet are fed to who? Animals. <laughs> Animals are now our great competitors. Cattle is now our main competitors. This is absurd. <laughs> but that's moving into my world of food more. I, I said, what did I want to do? I'm actually just going to, I'm not going to go into this because this is all stuff you can look at if you want to. Uh, let me go. Uh, I've got it in. Oh, actually, I like that one. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love it. This is, a, this is good, isn't it? I love that. Bigger. Actually, it's a bad that. Let me give you a full front. This is from the Chief Scientist Report on Obesity. Jeff and I helped do that. Uh, uh, in the middle, it's very simple. Obesity is a very simple model. It's eating too much, not taking enough exercise. It's dead easy, actually. But around that are all the factors that shape it. Okay? And it looks like, and if it's a thicker line, the evidence is very strong. It's a very powerful relationship. If it's a thinner line, it's not. And then you can see it goes into little eddies and worlds. You know. it's, it's lovely. It's much used, much cited. Uh, but actually, you can cluster it. The factors can sort of go, this is from the Chief Scientist Report. You can say it's clustered around, can you see it? Well, no, I think. Yeah, no, I'm sorry. Uh, uh, you, you can cluster it. Now, one of the reasons Jeff and I use ecological public health, I haven't explained why do I use the word ecological. Ecological thinking is essentially very simple. It's about complexity. It's about interactions. And ecological has tended to be used in two different ways. Some people have used, in the academic literature and in philosophy and in biology, to mean biology. Others have actually used ecological to mean societal. <coughs> what this does, and obesity is a really good example of it, is it's about both. And so we, we call the tradition of thinking um, ecological public health because actually this is what was done in the 19th century. It was reshaping the relationship between human bodies 
and the environment. <coughs> Both the built environment and the natural environment. And that is actually what we've got to get back onto and to do. Uh, we'll take all of that off. Um, at the end of our book, we do a deeply, deeply boring definition, <laughs> which I'll put up there, that bottom one. I mean, the most common definition of public health was actually done by an American public health man in 1920. And his phrase that public health is a science and art of preventing disease is constantly quoted, and you see it referred to, but very often people don't know it was in Winslow. But uh, we think that actually we need something better. So in our book we've done this very long version, which you can wade your way through. But essentially it is very simply that public health has got to be about reshaping the conditions to enable health to occur. What that means is that public health has got to be about progress. It's got to be about capturing the imagination. It's got to be about helping restructure how people live their lives. And they're not going to like it. But it'll be better in the end. That's tricky. If people didn't like Basil Get building the sewers. They didn't like constraints on coal fire heating houses. They didn't like safety belts. They didn't like traffic lights. They didn't like lots of things. But then it resettles the norms of society. And what we're not doing in the late 20th century and the beginning of the 21st century is we're not saying we've got to reset the rules for society. Mm -hmm. And that's what our book essentially says. We've got to reshape those rules to be able to get it back to that. All these things, by the way, are complicated things from the book, which I don't need to explain. I think I'll stop. I mean... You can now say, well, that was interesting. <laughs> what the hell do we do? You know? Well, it shapes everything, actually. It means you think very big. It means you don't deal with the trivial things. It's about setting the conditions. It means, for example, here we are in a car, car town. It means we actively plan to phase out the car. Because oil has underpinned our lack of movement. And we've built movement despite the car. That's a very radical thing to say, mm. to clean a car down. Mm. What would a good life be like if we didn't have oil? What would a good life be like if we really wanted to protect water systems? 50% of all the water you consume, 70% actually, sorry, is through the food that you eat. 70% of all drinkable water used on the planet is to agriculture. And half of that is for cereals, half of which are fed to animals, mm -hmm. who are also the second biggest user. Wow. <laughs> so you can see why I'm now on an international campaign that we now define what a sustainable diet is. We've got to not just think about nutrition, but about water footprints, about carbon footprints, about what is the food that I eat in relation to biodiversity. What is a good diet for biodiversity? I spent three days in Rome, the FAO, Food and Agricultural Centre, with biodiversity specialists trying to hammer that out. We don't know, actually. It means eating biodiversity. One of the rules we came up with is Actually, one of the best ways to protect biodiversity is to eat it, actually. So we want biodiversity in fields, not on the edge. And these are different rules. So I feel, in my own work, I'm poised from all of this thinking to reshape what I do. To say, we need new eco-nutrition... I've called for a good paper coming up. We need new eco-nutrition rules. Put it this way, if there was a war, if the Eurozone implodes and there are wars, which I think there will be, uh, could be, 
uh, well, I mean, there are wars. We know that there are always wars. Uh, but you know, if the European and the Western model is seriously altered, there'd be eco nutrition rules immediately. We'd have to have them. So my view is, I'm a gentleman. I argue this, and I'm not really will stop. Uh, actually, the fundamental issue that public health has to address is democracy. Mm. It's got to engage with people. Mm. Which, believe it or not, is why I came to Sweden to talk with you. Because I'm interested to know what you think. Mm. Stop. Very good. Thank you, sir.